to the International Space University Space Studies Program uh, Distinguished Lecture. Uh, first of all, I would like to remind you, please, if you can put your phones on silent. And uh, if there's uh, also emergency doors, there's ones in the back there, there's one on the left and one on the right. Uh, at the end of the presentation today, we'll be having questions and answers. If you have a question, please raise your hand and somebody will come to you with the microphone. So um, tonight, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Pete Warden. Uh, Dr. Pete Warden is the chairman of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation, and he's also the advisor to the government of Luxembourg on space resources. Previously, he was the center director at NASA Ames Research Center, where he led the staff of about 2,500 civil servants and contractors. And uh, he was overseeing an annual budget of about $800 million. And the, the NASA Ames Research Center provided the critical research and development support to make the NASA and the nation's aeronautic space missions possible. Dr. Warden is also a recognized expert on space and science issues and has been a leader in building partnerships between governments and the private sector internationally. Uh, Dr. Warden has authored over and co-authored about 150 scientific journals in astrophysics and space science and he also served as a science co-investigator for three NASA space science missions. Uh, Dr. Warden received the NASA Outstanding Leadership Medal for the 1994 Clementine mission to the moon and was named uh, in, 19, in 2009 Federal Laboratory Consortium Director of the Year. He's also the recipient of 2010 Arthur C. Clarke Innovation Award. Please help me welcome Dr. Pete Warden. Soon they'll be able to hear me. Well, I'm really uh, honored to be here in Ireland. Uh, I've never been here before. Uh, the 1880 U.S. Census says my gra great grandfather was from Ireland, and uh, the genetic testing says I'm 50% Irish, so, you know. And with the beer later, I'll think that'll come out. Uh, but uh, what I'd like to talk to you tonight about is starships and a few other things. Uh, the, uh, as noted, I worked for uh, a government agency for probably far too long, and uh, the, uh, uh, but uh, about two and a half years ago, I, I left to run the Breakthrough Prize Foundation. Oh, let me see here. i got to actually show this stuff, right? All right, here we are. Aha. Uh -huh. The, uh, uh, about six or seven years ago, my principal sponsor, Yuri Milner, who's a Russian uh, investor trained as a physicist, uh, was looking at lists of the most famous people on the planet, and he discovered there's almost none of these lists have uh, scientists on them. I mean, you may have Einstein or Hawking, but uh, very few others. So he decided that he wanted to give the biggest prize in science. Uh, so he started the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics uh, to three million, with a $3 million prize. Uh, and they've since added uh, uh, five prizes in life sciences and one in mathematics. Uh, now these, uh, uh, these are pretty cool prizes. Uh, there's, they're about three times the size of there's some Swedish prize I'd heard about. But uh, uh, about six years ago when I was the director of Ames, uh, uh, I had a visit from Vanity Fair. Now, it wasn't to talk about my nice hairdo or, uh, or good clothes, but uh, Vanity Fair, for those of you who don't know, uh, runs the uh, post-Oscar party, which I guess is the party of the year. I've never been invited, but probably won't be. Uh, but anyhow, they've been asked by Mr. Milner, 
who was since joined by uh, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, uh, Sergey Brin, the co-founder of Google, Andrews Whiskey, the founder of 23andMe, the company that said I was Irish, and uh, Jack Ma from uh, Alibaba uh, to do the, the, the prizes, but they wanted to do a really cool ceremony. And for those of you that have been in Silicon Valley, uh, they thought the coolest place was NASA Ames, which it is. Uh, the, uh, and so there's, there's these old 1930s airship hangars. Uh, so they decided to do the prize ceremony there. Uh, and it, the cool thing about it was that I actually got invited because I was a landlord. Uh, but, uh, you know, and, and it, they are really neat prizes. Uh, uh, unlike that Swedish prize that just has some king do it, we have God give our prizes. And uh, so last year Morgan Freeman was our, was our MC. Uh, the uh, the prizes themselves, there's, uh, they're, usually, they're presented by, uh, you probably recognize the kid on the right. Uh, the, uh, the lady in the center was one of the recipients, Helen Hobbs, who uh, uh, figured out a uh, genetic inhibitor for heart disease. And, and, the, and, the, and the lady there on, on your left, uh, I forgot her name, but I, th I think she's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Uh, so you have all these Hollywood people and these billionaires and but the real stars are the, uh, are the, are the scientists. Uh, I, I do want to bring to your attention that a couple of years ago we started a, a new prize, the Breakthrough Junior Challenge. Uh, and this is really cool. This is for a high school kid. Uh, if you know any young people in high school, uh, it's a pretty neat deal. The winner gets a $250,000 scholarship. The school gets about a $150,000 science lab. Uh, and the teacher that the student identifies gets a $50,000 check. Uh, the first year we did this, the student didn't tell the teacher that he'd nominated him. So we called up the teacher and said, "Where could you give us your bank account to send the check to? He said, he asked if this was a call from Nigeria. And so I said, the, uh, but we finally persuaded him we really were going to send him $50,000. Uh, but uh, this is a really cool thing. The announcement will come out in a couple of months. Uh, this last year, uh, uh, the winners, we gave two of them out. Uh, uh, and I was really pleased to see that, uh, that, that both the winners were, were young ladies. Uh, one was Deanna C. Uh, from Singapore, uh, who did a really cool thing on, on life sciences. And the other was Antonella Massini from Peru, uh, who did a really cool thing on physics. So uh, I suggest if you know a young person, this is a pretty good prize. Uh, plus, they get to go to the party and be presented the prize by God. Uh, but the real reason I came here is... Uh, or, or I took this job was to uh, uh, was breakthrough initiatives, and uh, this is where the starship comes in. But let me start with a little bit of rationale. Uh, the uh, you know one of the key, the key things I think that science increasingly tells us is that is that uh, life is a bit precarious. Uh, uh, in fact, I'll talk more about asteroids here at the end of my talk. But uh, a lot of things could end life on Earth. Uh, some of the things, are even things that we do, uh, some of them are things the, the universe may do to us. Uh, and one of the things I think that this begins to give you a mindset, and, I, and I'll get to the details in a second, uh, but I, I raise the ultimate threat. Uh, how many of you know what a death bubble is? Probably nobody. Uh, it's a string theory concept, which is pretty well validated, but uh, just to give you the, the quick and dirty de description. A string theorist uh, identify the universe as a 11th or 12th or 13th dimensional quantum state. Uh, now we can talk about that over many beers and it'll be clearer. Uh, but quantum states have three possible uh, possibilities. They can be stable, uh, in which case the universe really would be static. Uh, they can be unstable, in which case we wouldn't have been here because it wouldn't have lasted at all. The third thing is that uh, the quantum state can be metastable. This means that it's excited at some level, uh, but it also means it can drop to a lower state. Uh, and by the way, the uh, information from like the, the Higgs field tends to suggest we're in a metastable state. Uh, but what you conclude from this is that someplace in the universe, the that part of the universe could drop to a lower state. Uh, what happens then is it creates a new Big Bang. But what happens to the old universe? Well, at the speed of light, the front of the 
uh, of the wave front starts to expand and reprograms everything, which means we're gone. So this could have happened nearby, and we were here for one second, the next minute we're gone. So uh, this is the ultimate uh, potential fate of the universe. Uh, but uh, there's a couple things this leads to questions. And uh, uh, the first question is, uh, are we the only life in the universe? Because if we are, then we have a particular unique responsibility in terms of all of these, these uh, uh, possible bad outcomes. Uh, the second question is, uh, maybe even more important, is that if there is life elsewhere, is there intelligent life? Uh, and there's a sub-question of this, is if there are intelligent life, maybe we can talk to it. Uh, now, that's an argument, so I'll get to that. Uh, and maybe most important, can we travel between stars and maybe even eventually between galaxies? Uh, the reason that's important is that's one way to outrun the death bubble, because if you start expanding uh, that there's life far enough apart that the accelerating expansion of the universe will eventually go faster than the speed of light so you can escape the death bubble. Uh, it's kind of cool stuff. But, uh, but at any rate, now let's kind of come back to Earth. Uh, life. And, and I'm not a biologist, so I'm probably going to goof this up, uh, but I'll try. Uh, all life on Earth is divided into two general categories. Uh, the, about three and a half billion years ago, uh, prokaryotes, uh, which bacteria uh, and another uh, form of single-celled organisms that are called archaea, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, emerged. Uh, we don't know how. We're beginning to have a few ideas, maybe. Uh, but these are pretty simple. There's a, uh, a very simple DNA uh, that programs the, the that provides basic programming for the cell, uh, and a cell coat, and, a, and, and not a lot of other things. Um, but uh, the other form of life, which we are, uh, and uh, uh, is called a eukaryote. And uh, eukaryotes have a much more complicated genome, uh, but maybe the most important thing is that they they can be much larger, although some of them are small. Uh, but they have uh, or what are called organelles inside the, the nucleus, which are uh, some of these can produce uh, orders of magnitude more energy for the cell because there's a lot of them. Uh, so by having three orders of magnitude more energy, the cell can be much more complex. Now again, as I said, all life is divided into these two general categories, uh, single-celled organisms, prokaryotes, uh, and they're also single-celled eukaryotes, uh, are divided into two other classes, bacteria and archaea, that mostly differ by the chemistry of the, of the cell, wall and a few other things. Uh, by the way, we didn't even know archaea existed until about 30 years ago, so, and it's half the life on, uh, on Earth, perhaps. Uh, but uh, wh where this became significant is about a billion years ago, give or take a few hundred million years, uh, this is the current hypothesis that, that a prokaryote, in this case an archaea, uh, ingested some aerobic bacteria. Uh, the, somehow these, they formed a symbiosis, uh, and these uh, bacteria over time developed into the organelles that that enable a cell to have a lot more energy in, uh, uh, in animals. Uh, these are the mitochondria. Uh, in plants, they're the chloroplasts that convert sunlight to energy. Uh, so this is a pretty unique event, and it actually is what probably gave rise to much more sophisticated uh, forms of life and, and a lot more energy uh, uh, using forms. So there's kind of three alternatives. Again, uh, you'll find that I like things that come in threes. Uh, but uh, the first alternative is that any life, this event three and a half billion years ago, was singular. Uh, now, the very fact that there's two different classes of, of prokaryotes may suggest this is not the case. Uh, but if it is the case, we may be really alone. Uh, the second possibility is that, is that life is very common, but this symbiosis was very rare. Uh, so that. If we look in the universe, we may find lots of simple single-celled organisms, but that we find that intelligence and, and even more complex organisms 
are extremely rare, and we may be the only one in the galaxy or even the only one in the universe, in which case we're also alone. Uh, the third alternative uh, is that life is very common, but so too is intelligence, and we should find it everywhere. Uh, so uh, we started uh, in uh, uh, on July 20th, uh, 2015, uh, with our first initiative. Uh, this is uh, Yuri Milner, our founder, at the stage, and you might recognize the scientist there to the right, uh, who's one of our overseers, uh, Stephen Hawking. Uh, we started our first initiative, which was called Breakthrough Listen, and this is a revitalized effort to uh, to see if there's intelligence uh, somewhere in the universe. Now, the first efforts to look for, or scientific efforts to look for intelligence signals uh, began in the 1960s. Uh, uh, Frank Drake, uh, a very famous radio astronomer, uh, began these efforts. Uh, he, by the way, is the uh, chairman of one of our advisory boards, uh, uh, a really impressive guy. Uh, the, uh, uh, but, you know, I kind of grew up in astronomy saying, well, we looked, we didn't see anything, there isn't anything. Uh, now, another famous SETI astronomer, Jill Tarter, uh, kind of explained that what we've done to date is sort of like walking down to the ocean here uh, looking for fish, dipping a glass in the ocean and say there's no fish, uh, and going away. Uh, she suggests we should at least try to use a trawler. Uh, so that's what we're trying to do. Uh, Mr. Milner committed $100 million uh, over the next decade for a revitalized SETI search. Uh, we were able to uh, literally purchase 20% of the time on this telescope. This is the largest steered radio telescope in the world. It's 100 meters uh, across, a very impressive instrument. Uh, we also have 25% of the time on this telescope. Uh, this is the uh, Parkes Radio Telescope in Australia. It's a 65-meter uh, antenna. It's the second largest steered antenna in the southern hemisphere. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, any of you that are from Australia or visit Australia ought to go see this. There's, this is a very famous antenna. It is actually the antenna that received the Apollo 11 moonwalk. Uh, there's a really cool Australian movie called The Dish that you ought to go see. Uh, it, it, it's it's really neat movie, and it's a family-friendly movie, so you can take your family to it, uh, or you can take a nice person like me to it. Uh, but uh, I actually uh, watched it on the airplane on the way down when I signed an agreement with, uh, with Australians. Uh, we also have started a program, and we're going to expand considerably to look for optical signals. Increasingly, we're using uh, optical a means to communicate. Uh, so this is a, the automated planet finder at uh, Lick Observatory. We're lo looking at the nearest stars for potential laser signals. Uh, I'll explain in a minute why lasers may be extremely important. Uh, by the way, the automated planet finder is not the, the big white dome with the laser coming out of it. Uh, it's one of those small white domes, that's, uh, uh, but it's actually almost the same size telescope as, uh, as the 120 inch. Uh, in October uh, this uh, last year, we signed an agreement with the uh, National Astronomical Observatory of China to, uh, to use this telescope. This is the 500 meter. Uh, it's the world's largest radio telescope, uh, which is uh, uh, just coming online. Uh, it's a fixed antenna in a, in a, uh, in a valley. Uh, a few weeks ago, we signed an agreement with the Jodrell Bank radio telescope in the UK. Uh, this is the oldest big radio telescope, uh, developed in the 1950s. Uh, and we will soon sign an agreement uh, uh, with South Africa, the square kilometer array Meerkat uh, prototype for the square kilometer array. And this will eventually be the world's largest radio telescope uh, equivalent of it. That's why it's called square kilometer array. So we're taking all this data and uh, putting as much as we can online. It's been going for about two years. Uh, no aliens yet, but a lot of cool science. Uh, now, I mentioned communicating with aliens. Uh, I have to tell you this is a bit of a sensitive issue because Stephen Hawking thinks it's a bad idea, uh, and he's one of my leaders. <laughs> uh, so we've sort of soft-pedaled this, but we may eventually have a, some sort of public uh, uh, contest to both look at the technical side and the, uh, and the, and the, and the message content. Uh, I will say that... Uh, uh, that there have been messages sent. This is the famous Arecibo message, which was sent in the 1970s. Uh, it was uh, put together by, by Frank Drake and Carl Sagan, 
Uh, I, I might add that Carl Sagan's widow, Ann Druyan, and the Cosmos uh, series creator is another one of our chair persons for our, our advisory committee. Uh, now, I'm not sure if I received this message I would understand anything. Uh, the, I guess that life on Earth is this funny, you know, square red thing, but uh, at any rate, this is supposedly a very clever message. Uh, but th the next big initiative is the one that, you know, I think I'm, one of the main reasons I came to work for, uh, for the Breakthrough Initiatives is Breakthrough Starshot. Uh, on April 12th of, uh, of 2016, we announced uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this effort. Uh, again, we did this at the New World Trade Center in, uh, in New York. Uh, uh, Milner and, and Hawking, uh, uh, which, which are two-thirds of our oversight committee for this. The other third is Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, there's Freeman Dyson there, who actually went to sleep during the press conference, but he's allowed because he's really brilliant. He's old. Uh, the uh, Andrewian, uh, the chairman of our advisory panel is, uh, is uh, Professor Avi Loeb there in the middle. He's the chairman of the astronomy department at Harvard. Uh, Mae Jemison, uh, uh, astronaut, uh, uh, she runs something called the Hundred Year Starship Foundation, which has pioneered a lot of this. And then there's some goofy guy there. Uh, now, why would we think that that it's sort of neat to go to nearby stars? Uh, well, when I went to graduate school last century, <laughs> in the middle of the century, uh, we sort of thought maybe one in ten thousand stars had a planetary system, and and uh, you know, maybe there's one in a million had an Earth-sized planet. Uh, but uh, when I was at NASA Ames, I was really honored to have one of our key programs being the Kepler mission, which uh, was able to determine that essentially every star in the galaxy has, uh, has a planetary system. Uh, what this did is it observed about 150,000 stars like the sun, uh, and we looked for shadows of a planet crossing in front of the stellar disk. Uh, we've now determined from this that Maybe a quarter of the stars like the sun have a planet like the Earth in the habitable zone, which all it means is that liquid water could exist on the surface. Uh, but recently, uh, other data has, uh, has shown that, that most, well, most of the stars in the galaxy are these little small, they're called red dwarfs. Uh, but it looks like essentially every one of those has, uh, has Earth-sized planets. Uh, this is TRAPPIST-1, which uh, a few months ago was discovered that not... It, it didn't have one Earth-sized planet. It had seven of them, three of which are in the habitable zone. Uh, and this is about 30 light years away. Uh, so we're beginning to look that maybe things like the Earth may be pretty common. So the question is, can we go there? Uh, well, this is uh, the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, it's the fastest thing that humans have ever made. Uh, it's about 130 times the distance from the Earth to the sun, uh, out from the sun. Uh, at the speed it's going, if it was aimed in the right direction, we would get to the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, in about 80,000 years. So it's unlikely we'll get funding for this mission. Uh, so we have to look at something else. Now the question is, that how fast do you need to go to get to the nearest star? Well, the nearest star, Alpha Centauri, is, is in the astronomer's terms, 300,000 astronomical units. It means it's 300,000 times further away from the Earth than the Sun is. Uh, so if you kind of figure that you want to get there in some reasonable time, it means we need to go a thousand times faster than Voyager, uh, roughly 20% the speed of light. So can we do that? That's the big question. Now, just to, to note that the first half of last century, uh, we increased the speed we could go by about a factor of a thousand. So our challenge is, can we do that in the next few decades? Now, uh, I'm a physicist as well, so I have to put one equation up. Uh, this is the rocket equation. And I'm not going to go through all the terms, but just say that there's a parameter. You know, that, In fact, I was honored yesterday to watch the rockets go up. Uh, how many can tell me what the specific impulse of that, those, those uh, solid rocket engines were? About 200, yep, exactly. I can tell <laughs> somebody that actually knows. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, a high-performance rocket like the shuttle main engines had something like uh, 400. So, you know, you can kind of 
figure out that uh, with a chemical engine, uh, could you go to the nearest star? And the answer is yes. Uh, but uh, we would need roughly the mass of the galaxy and fuel to do it. Uh, so that's probably not going to work. Uh, it, that budget is also a little bit above, you know, even Luxembourg's budget, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but what you need to, to, to get there if you're going to use a rocket is a, is a specific impulse of about a million. Uh, in fact, people that study this call it the magic million. So as I said, uh, we're not going to do it with chemical uh, engines. Uh, but uh, what about nuclear engines? Now, nuclear fission and fusion, uh, nuclear fission has a about 100,000 specific impulse. Uh, nuclear fusion, maybe half a million to a million. Uh, so this is a potential thing. Uh, and we did look at uh, fission and fusion. But uh, controlled fusion, is, uh, I, I was always taught when I went to graduate school that fusion was the energy source of the fut future. Uh, always has been, and as we found now, always will be. Uh, so the until a fusion rocket works, uh, uh, this is probably uh, out of the question. Now, initially, when we started looking at, uh, at studies, and we, we did a big study that Professor Loeb uh, led, uh, I was very excited about antimatter. Uh, now, a, a matter-antimatter reaction has a specific impulse of about 8 million, so really good, huh? Uh, the, in fact, NASA, through their in innovative and advanced concepts uh, program, uh, funded some studies on this. Uh, this is a, uh, a picture of one of those. And, I got very excited about this and showed Yuri Milner it. He got very excited about it, but then he showed it to Professor Witten at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton, who said, oh, these guys are full of shit. Uh, they, they've made a mistake of about four orders of magnitude or five, uh, which they did, by the way. Uh, always check, check your numbers. Uh, but uh, uh, the, uh, we can make about 10 to the 14 antiprotons. These are the core of antihydrogen today uh, in a year, but we need about 10 to the 28th antiprotons to, to go to the nearest star, so this is probably also a little bit in the future. Uh, although I will tell you, uh, these are a couple of physicists that used to work at the, uh, at the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory. They actually have a concept that does seem to be interesting that showed that, uh, that uh, perhaps you could use anti-electrons, positrons, to induce fusion. So. Uh, they've gotten some money from a number of investors, so hopefully that works. Uh, but it's still pretty far in the future. Now, I can't resist putting this up. Uh, this was published by a Johnson Space Center guy. I can see the Johnson Space people are wincing. It's pretty cool, actually. This is the most cited paper in the Journal of Propulsion and Power ever. Uh, this is by uh, Harold Sonny White uh, that uh, talked about uh, you know, a uh, uh, some sort of thrust that's uh, an electromagnetic thrust, uh, and showed some tests. Uh, now, I I thought this was complete rubbish, and it probably is. Uh, except that uh, last year I went to China, and the the deputy head of the Chinese space agency told me that they've tested this, they've now announced this, and it worked on their space station. So, but there's no details published. So, maybe, maybe not. Uh, so we decided to go to something we know works, uh, the uh, sailboats. And uh, this is an old idea uh, to, uh, to leave the fuel behind. Uh, it was actually first suggested by this guy uh, in 1610. Kepler wrote a letter to Galileo, and it was probably written in Latin, but uh, the rough translation is that, uh, that we can build ships for heavenly winds, uh, and some will sail into the great vastness. Now, this actually works. Uh, this is the Planetary Society uh, light sail test uh, a few years ago. Uh, and you can use sunlight to push things. The trouble is sunlight is pretty dilute. Uh, maybe you can get a few hundred kilometers a second, but certainly not some reasonable fraction of light speed. But we were very intrigued with this. So we, uh, there was also a, a study done by uh, the the NASA Innovative and Advanced Concepts uh, program uh, done by Professor Phil Lubin at, uh, at the University of California at Santa Barbara. And he pointed out a couple things. He said, first of all, that 
we were able to make much smaller spacecraft because of microelectronics. And second, we're able to, to sort of using sunlight, concentrate laser light. And a lot of this has to do with technology being developed for laser communications. Uh, so he proposed a really powerful laser, about a kilometer square. It's at only 50 gigawatts. Uh, this, by the way, is a bad artist conception of that. Uh, the uh, uh, his laser beam directors don't look like radio telescopes, but the artists thought they looked cooler. Uh, by the way, if we're going to the nearest star, this has to be in the southern hemisphere, uh, probably in Chile. So when we published this picture, we did get uh, a question from the Chilean government that said, you're going to do what in our country? Uh, so I've since been to Chile. I've talked to the Chilean president and, and, uh, and uh, a couple people that may be the next president. And uh, they're actually very excited about this. So it was good sometime to ask, though, before you actually start building things. Uh, but uh, these two technologies look pretty good. L let me talk about lasers first. Now, today, if we tried to build a 50 gigawatt laser, it would cost literally trillions of dollars. Uh, but we're seeing kind of a Moore's Law trend in lasers uh, that actually every, uh, every couple years uh, we get an order of magnitude decrease in the cost per watt. Uh, uh, and uh, we get an increase in an in a order of magnitude in the, uh, in the power of lasers. Uh, these curves show us that within about 15 years we think it's feasible to, to build a laser this size uh, for something like 10 billion U.S. dollars. Uh, so our first objective is to see if that trend continues. Now the second big issue is the size of the spacecraft. And uh, uh, this is a typical communication satellite today. It weighs a few metric tons. Uh, but there's no reason that we can't make things a lot smaller. Uh, as a lot of you know, that CubeSats that, that, uh, that are three orders of magnitude smaller than this uh, look pretty, pretty good today. We do just about everything that comes with big satellites. Uh, but we want to take this three orders of magnitude even smaller. Now, some of you may have an Apple Watch with a chip in it. Uh, the, uh, uh, that chip had, does about, just about everything a spacecraft could do. So we started looking at, can we, can we build what we call a star chip? Uh, and the answer appeared to be yes. Uh, the, uh, uh, th this is a prototype that, that we actually put together. And uh, I brought one with me. That's a star chip. Uh, these were put together by uh, uh, Professor Mason Peck and, uh, and his postdoctoral, then graduate student, uh, Zach Manchester, who's just got hired at Stanford as an assistant professor. By the way, if you want to do graduate study in aerospace engineering, uh, talk to Professor Manchester. He's a really cool guy. Uh, but uh, this really looks like it would work. Uh, by the way, I challenged Elon to bring his spaceship with him in his pocket. I didn't get a very good answer. Uh, now, this stuff is real. Uh, uh, on the uh, 23rd of June, a uh, uh, number of small sats were launched uh, uh, on uh, Indian booster, the PSLV-2, and uh, uh, one of them was Venta, which was the Lithu or Latvia's first satellite, and it carried uh, uh, one of these, uh, an earlier prototype that weighed about four grams uh, that was to demonstrate power from the solar power and communications, which it has done perfectly, so we're very excited about it. So our idea is that you build a light sail, about four meters in diameter, and you attach a star chip to it. Now, by the way, this is rubbish. It's not what it would look like, uh, but uh, again, the artist had to do something. Uh, but this is very feasible, and uh, uh, in September, we'll be announcing uh, uh, several million dollars worth of opportunities for both the laser uh, and the material for the light sail. Now, this is a big challenge because to get to 20% the speed of light, you have to accelerate it pretty fast. And uh, the light sail is four meters in diameter. If you can calculate that 50 gigawatts hits it, uh, it has a modest 60,000 Gs acceleration. Uh, but by the way, electronics can take it. There's been tests that show that. Uh, and uh, uh, after a couple minutes, you're going at 20% the speed of light, and then you coast. Uh, into the nearby star system and you fly through it pretty fast, uh, but you can take some cool data. Now, we're certainly aware these are really formidable challenges. Uh, there's at least 20 or so that we've identified. You also notice I put policy issues on there. 
the amount of kinetic energy this thing has when it's going 20% the speed of light is about the same energy as a small nuclear weapon. So there are some issues. Uh, we have begun discussions with the UN Outer Space Office uh, how we would control these things. But these, we think, are all solvable. Uh, so what I said was, uh, as I said, we're starting a $100 million initial research program uh, for about five to six years. We'll be researching uh, a couple key things, uh, the lasers, the uh, uh, light sail, uh, and communications. Um, we hope uh, uh, in about five years that we begin building a prototype system about a billion dollars, privately funded. Uh, and then uh, ultimately in 20 years or so, we could build a full-scale system uh, for about 10 billion, which would be public-private partnership. Uh, we have an advisory panel with some pretty famous folks on it. Uh, we actually took a couple of Swedish prize winners because they seem pretty smart. Uh, we also gave some of them breakthrough prizes, so they're rich too. Uh, so as I said, uh, there'll be an RFP released here in, uh, uh, in the next months. Uh, now the last question is, is there any life anywhere? Uh, so we began a program uh, called Breakthrough Watch. Uh, and of course, the first place you look is in our own solar system. Uh, this is the obvious first target. Uh, by the way, I personally believe there is life there. Uh, but uh, this seems to be well studied by various world space agencies. Uh, but I add that probably the most interesting place in the solar system is uh, Enceladus, which is uh, one of the inner moons of Saturn. Uh, the interesting thing about it is it's, uh, there are geysers of water from the South Pole that, uh, that Cassini already showed seem to be having some simple uh, organic or potentially organic molecules. Uh, so we are looking at uh, now a potential private mission uh, that, would, uh, that would go visit this. Uh, that's still just an early study phase, but uh, this is some place that we may find life in our solar system. Uh, but our primary target is the, is the nearest star system, Alpha Centauri. Uh, as I said, it's in the southern hemisphere. It's at minus 61 degrees. It's the second brightest star in the southern hemisphere. Uh, by the way, if you haven't ever been to the southern hemisphere to see, a, see the night sky, uh, it is awesome. Uh, you know, that, that uh, God did a bad thing in putting most of the people in the northern hemisphere because we're faced away from the center of the galaxy. But... You can actually see what it's really cool, uh, the, the night sky. Uh, but uh, Alpha Centauri is about 4.3 light years away. Uh, there are three stars in the system. Uh, two of them are more or less sun-like. One of them is a little tiny star. And when we made our announcement, we didn't know there were any planets in this system. But uh, sometimes it's better to be lucky than good. And uh, few months after we made our announcement, the European Southern Observatory uh, announced that a planet that's in the habitable zone of this red dwarf star, Proxima Centauri, which they called Proxima B, uh, had, a, uh, had a planet in the habitable zone that's about Earth size. Uh, it was Professor uh, Gillam and Glada Scuda of the Queen Mary University in London uh, was the principal investigator on that. Uh, now, of course, they already have a picture of it, so I guess we don't need to go there. Uh, but uh, the, uh, so the, this, actually, this star is actually, the, of the three stars in the Alpha Centauri system, is the closest. Uh, it's actually about a tenth of a, almost a tenth of a light year closer than the other two stars. Uh, so one of the questions is, are these life-bearing? So we've decided to do an intensive study on these. Uh, this is the uh, European Southern Observatory's very large telescope, VLT. Uh, we signed a contract a couple months ago that to modify these to look, we think we can directly image a planet not in the Proxima system, but in the Alpha Centauri A and B system, which would be really exciting because those are like the sun. Uh, so we be, we'll be beginning observations next year. Uh, a few months ago, the European Southern Observatory uh, uh, began construction on this. This is the European Extremely Large Telescope. This actually is big enough that it could get a spectrum of the atmosphere, so we could potentially find life signals. So very exciting effort. Uh, now, I have to say as an astronomer that the naming of these things is always kind of goofy. The very large telescope, an extremely large telescope. Uh, by the way, this is, this is real. 
that initially this was called the overwhelmingly large telescope, uh, but there was a budget cut, so it's just the extremely large telescope. Uh, by the way, the thing we're going to build is going to, because it's a kilometer, it actually could work as a telescope. It's, we're calling it the awesomely large telescope. Uh, we're also uh, working on a, uh, a space mission uh, that, because there are two stars, the two brighter stars actually orbit each other in about 70 years, uh, we have a program to precisely measure the position relative one relative to the other. Uh, from little wobbles, if there's a planet orbiting one, we could get the mass. Uh, this is a program that's led by uh, Professor Peter Tuttle from the University of Sydney. Uh, so again, uh, we're, we're doing uh, you know, global efforts, which is kind of the cool thing about a private foundation. Uh, the last thing is we have an annual conference. Uh, uh, we hold it around Yuri's night. Uh, by the way, Yuri Milner was born, was named after Yuri Gagarin, so he has a particular fondness for Yuri. Uh, so if, if you happen to be in California, uh, please come to our conference. Uh, this last year we looked at uh, uh, how we could observe remotely and what kind of instruments to fly by and how do we essentially look in detail at uh, a SETI search. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, looking at the nearest stars uh, uh, for evidence of extraterrestrial intelligence is actually a good idea. You know, I'd always heard that, well, you know, we shouldn't worry about transmitting signals because since the 1950s we've been transmitting I Love Lucy to the stars. Uh, well, it turns out, until recently, these really big telescopes like the 500 meter, we could not have detected I Love Cork from even Proxima B until recently. So it makes sense to look at them. Uh, we are interested in working globally. Uh, at that conference, we invited the heads of, of uh, the World Space Agency science efforts. Most of them came. You might recognize some of them. Uh, and uh, uh, so we're planning to work together with these folks. So if all goes well around 2067, uh, maybe we'll get a picture like this uh, uh, back from, from Alpha Centauri. Now, I'd like to change the topic slightly. As, as I noted, uh, uh, Mr. Milner allows me to do one other thing. I'm an advisor to the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg on space resources, and I want to close with a few remarks about that. Now, one of the things that you know, I work very closely with the Deputy Prime Minister, Etienne Schneider, and, and when he gets up, uh, I've convinced him that, that, that uh, Luxembourg may end up being the real space power. and. Uh, so when we have settlements on the moon and Mars, I, uh, he says, and I agree with him, I think they may speak Luxembourgish. So I, I had to put the Luxembourg flag up here. This is the, the Grand Duke's flag. Uh, and, and I don't know if I translated this right, but I think it says something in Luxembourgish like the, 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 the people of the solar system in the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. So uh, uh, I, I hope you'll all learn Luxembourgish. Uh, by the way, a few weeks ago I bought an apartment there. Uh, I do know two words of Luxembourgish. In the morning, you say moyen, and uh, when you're going to have a drink, you have a, a pot, which we're about to have in a bit. And, and I think I have another presentation here very quickly because I want to raise a, uh, a neat possibility you might be interested in. Uh, let's see. Experts here will tell me. Th this last few charts are a paid announcement by one of my sponsors. There, here we are. Uh, I'd like to bring to your attention something that, that's going on in the next few months. Uh, there's a, a space exploration masters uh, competition. Uh, I'm one of the judges, so I'll take bribes. But, uh, Actually not, uh, but uh, uh, Luxembourg is is uh, hosting along with other uh, agencies in Europe a, a competition, uh, a business competition. Uh, by the way, Luxembourg is about to form a space agency, which is unlike other space agencies. It'll really be a sovereign wealth fund for space. They're they're really looking for startups, so uh, there'll be a Luxembourg prize uh, for new business, uh, and with uh, up to over uh, 400,000 euros in, in, a, in a pool. Uh, the European Space Agency has, uh, has uh, added a number of 10,000 euro prizes. Uh, 
the uh, this is the time scale for it. Uh, it was launched uh, here about a month ago. Uh, you have a submission time through the uh, through the beginning of September, uh, and there'll be an award ceremony in November. So uh, I know a lot of you are interested in in space entrepreneurship. So uh, I would encourage you to put together some some proposals and and uh, move forward with this. Uh, uh, and help Luxembourgish become the language of the solar system. Uh, so let me stop there. I'd be happy to answer questions about uh, any and all of the, what I talked about. Thank you. Yep. I guess I see some. I guess there's a couple of microphones supposed to come around, right? Hi there. Um, fascinating talk. Thank you. So you're going to build a $10 billion laser system and use it for Alpha Centauri. Right. Are you going to go to other, send out a fleet of probes? Oh, absolutely. Well, we're going to send hundreds of them. Uh, I didn't go into the details, but the, we don't use, you know, 50 gigawatts of power all the time. So you actually store the power for a day. So once a day we would, we would fire one of these. Uh, one of these star ships, uh, they would be carried on a mothership, and be in a highly elliptical orbit, uh, sort of in the direction of Alpha Centauri. Uh, when they're at uh, the uh, the apogee, they would they would throw out a one star ship. It would move away because you don't want to get hit with 50 gigawatts of power. Then it's pushed for a few minutes, and the next day you do another one. We would uh, we're going to be looking at all the nearby stars if we find that that there's nothing in the Alpha Centauri system or nothing interesting, we would probably go on to Barnard Star, one of the other ones. If, if we find any evidence of, of a life-bearing planet within about 10 light years, uh, that would be our target. So that's what our hopes are. So absolutely. we're yeah. Now, by the way, this could also revolutionize other transportation in the solar system. If you can send you know, a gram chip at, at point 0.2 C, you can send you know, tens or hundreds of kilograms at hundreds of thousands of kilometers a second. So I'm sure this would be used for other things. Uh, I might also add that that's enough power that if there happened to be a nasty asteroid, we can push it out of the way. So it's uh, so we think this is something that the world would really want to do. Uh, we plan that it would ultimately be a, a globally controlled effort to make sure you didn't hit things you're not supposed to. Uh, so we're, we're, we've begun preliminary discussions with the UN Outer Space Office. So, so this is a, this will be... A, uh, I think uh, a really cool effort to, for the global space community and a public-private partnership. Yes, uh, I have another question. Sure. Uh, yeah. First of all, thank you for your presentation. Um, I would like to know what are you actually going to measure? Is it an analog to the flyby missions that you do in the current solar system? And do you believe it's the the best way to detect uh, life? Well. Y the answer is yes, it's a flyby, and it'd be very similar to the flyby of Pluto, for example. Example, the, the primary instruments would probably be cameras, maybe some low-resolution spectrometers. Uh, we may also be able to put some particle detectors uh, and, uh, and and magnetometers. One of the key questions about a planet, especially in a red dwarf star system, is that that uh, red dwarf stars are flare stars. And they have, and the planet would be orbiting very close, so you get a lot of radiation. So you'd like to see if there's a magnetic field that protects the planet. Uh, the, uh, the 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 answer, of course, one of the big questions always is, well, what if you spent this much money to build a giant space telescope? Uh, it would have to be a pretty giant one, you know, thousands of kilometers in diameter. Uh, on the other hand, if you remember, one of our motivations is the question: Can you travel between stars? So it is broader than just finding out if it's life-bearing. Uh, I mean, the ultimate home run is we flew by the Proxima B, and not only we found there was evidence of life, we saw all sorts of cities and cool stuff. And that's probably unlikely. But uh, uh, I think more important is that this is the century that human aspirations and attention and reach is going to move beyond our solar system to the nearest stars. So that it's really a, a, a pushing things forward. Uh, this is not something that space agencies will do much with for a while. 
we hope by privately funding it for a, a decade or so that we can then bring the technology to the point where the world space agencies pick it up. But yes, that's, yeah. Uh, a couple of questions. One is uh, uh, how do you deal with the interstellar dust issue? Uh, yeah, that sucks. With, but, and, yeah. <laughs> and the other is can That's you, a technical term. Can you see uh, people uh, incoming uh, laser uh, propulsion coming in at us? Well, those are both very good questions. Uh, you, you notice the interstellar dust was one of our big problems. Uh, interstellar gas is not a problem. In fact, it actually may be an energy source. It's one option for power for this thing is to that the interstellar gas will heat one side of the, the, the sail and the chip so you can pull energy off it. Uh, the other option, of course, is radioactive power sources. But uh, the, uh, uh, the, ga the dust might be a problem. Uh, we think we can shield against some of it. Uh, but there's a, the other thing is we're just going to send a lot of them. Uh, actually, the latest designs that we've looked at that you would have a spherical light sail and we would distribute multiple components you know, throughout the whole sail so that you could lose a lot of them. Uh, but the uncertainty in interstellar dust density is pretty, there's like several orders of magnitude. So earlier missions that we would plan would probably begin to measure that. So we'd see if, you know, is it going to be a, a serious problem or not. We're kind of in that uncertainty range. Uh, the uh, second question again was? Yeah, incoming, yes. Uh, well, any technology we have now, now if you have a chip that's, uh, you know, uh, even if it's attached to a light sail, we couldn't see. Uh, it would just fly right through. Uh, but uh, what we could see, and this is, this is why we, we mentioned optical SETI, is that the laser itself, uh, that laser is bright enough and powerful enough you could see it uh, across the universe. So at multiple gigaparsec ranges if it happened to be aimed at you. So we're looking at a potential for a all-sky optical uh, transient search. Uh, so we could look for that. Uh, inc incidentally, uh, Professor Loeb uh, published a paper a few uh, weeks ago, or months ago, where he looked at uh, that one, one of the unexplained phenomena in the uh, universe is what's called fast radio burst, FRBs. And uh, uh, he calculated that, uh, that, you know, these things are generally accepted to be at gigaparsec ranges, that uh, what if those were some alien civilization using radio to accelerate probes, and how big a probe would they accelerate? Uh, it turns out that, that uh, the amount of power that they're putting into those these things could be, uh, uh, you know, uh, 100,000 to a million tons, and you accelerate it at 10% the speed of light, uh, and it, it's about the, about the amount of power that the Earth intercepts from the sun. So his calculation said, well, it's feasible, unlikely, but feasible that these are alien civilizations doing something like we're doing or thinking about doing. So uh, it's interesting that that uh, these levels of powers are something that an advanced civilization might be able to engineer. So it's pretty cool stuff. So this may be the way that we would detect evidence of, of some really advanced civilization. Yeah. Hi, uh, I was just wondering, like, if you do send uh, starships out there, the problem I see with it is that if it takes a couple of decades to send a ship out, after a couple of decades, the chip could be obsolete, and there could be other stuff that you want to learn about it that the chip can't perform. You well, can't we would perform. send new chips, <laughs> and, and I, I think one of the things that that uh, I, I mean, this happens today that it takes decades for you know for a spacecraft to get to the outer solar system, and uh, yet we still send them. And from what you learn, you you try to send a more advanced technology. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, again, it's from each effort you learn how to do the next one even better. Uh, so maybe we can get higher speeds, uh, half the speed of light, and uh, you could send things faster. You could send them to more places. Uh, with the current technology, it's very difficult to figure out how to stop at the other end. Uh, although there was a paper published by a couple German scientists that said if you're willing to wait, wait not a couple decades, but a century or two, uh, you could actually use the starlight 
in the target system to slow down the chip so it could go into orbit. So, you know, it's kind of neat. I think, again, we're trying to ignite human interest and attention to the nearby stars. So, you know, it's a... Uh, and and, and you know, one, of the, one of the arguments for doing it now is uh, I'm an old guy, and I want to see us get there before I, I leave. So some of you younger folks, uh, it's probably not as big an issue, but I should always do it now if you can. Yeah, I would like to understand which kind of technology are you envisioning to use for sending back information from this tiny device okay. from such a distance? Very good question. On that chip is a small pulse watt class laser. Uh, we would probably use the sail itself or we might deploy a small optical element. So that would send the signal back towards the Earth. We have to use that transmit array, which as I mentioned was a kilometer telescope, is a receiver, uh, and we've calculated that you can get a few, uh, a few kilobits to a few ten kilobits per second uh, from interstellar distances. But that's why the third major challenge that we're going to start spending money on is is how to close that laser, that uh, laser link back. But it uh, that was one of the key things that that we figured out that you can do it, uh, although it's really hard. Uh, but uh, that's the most likely way to get the signal back is to use a small laser. It's about the trappers planets. Um, what will be the names of the three ones that have a chance of ha of being inhabited by life, and what percentage chance would they have? That's a very good question. Uh, the The naming of of planets is the province of the International Astronomical Union. Uh, they vote on these things. They're the ones that voted to take Pluto's status as a planet away. Uh, why I hate them. Uh, I'm a member. I voted against that, by the way. Uh, but the, uh, uh, they're right now discussing how to officially name these planets. Uh, they haven't really, right now they're named, you know, you know, Trappist A, B, C, D, E, not a very imaginative name. Uh, by the way, the, 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 the star was, uh, was called Trappist. Uh, one, it was, uh, it was really an unknown star. Uh, and uh, that's an unofficial name. It, it turns out that the, the uh, people that discovered this are from Liège, Belgium, and they were drinking Trappist beer. And so that's kind of an interesting story. But at some point, uh, the International Astronomical Union will have a convention uh, of how to name them. Uh, as far as the likelihood of life, uh, I don't know. I mean, a lot of the, this is a, a very young star. It's uh, about 500 million years old, so it is unlikely, at least as we understand life, that it would have arisen yet on those uh, those planets. I think it's much more likely to be an older star like Proxima Centauri, which is five billion years old. But again, we don't know enough about how life began. So uh, when we start building these really big telescopes, which uh, we're doing on the ground and eventually in space, uh, what we would look for is to see a spectrum of the atmosphere. And so if we looked at the atmosphere and we saw signals that indicated uh, well, th two things we looked for. We looked for a liquid, probably water, in the atmosphere. And then we looked for something called a non-equilibrium gas. Uh, a non-equilibrium gas is a, is a component that wouldn't exist unless there was a life process to maintain it. Like in our atmosphere, that's oxygen. Uh, and there may be other things like met methane and other, uh, other chemicals. Hello? Oh, yes, it is. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It was fascinating. I'm wondering about the actual um, launch of the chip in the first place. You yeah. launch it in the conventional sense, and then you fire a laser at it? Yes. And you, 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 we'd have a mothership that would look like that ComSat. And so we'd launch it in a highly elliptical orbit using a rocket, a conventional rocket. Uh, it, would c it would contain thousands of these chips. And uh, so w once a day, or, or, or when it at perigee, it would throw one out. Uh, so it's uh, you need to get it in space to start with. So that's the best idea. Well, I think we're about end of time, right? Yes. And and we're getting into the beer drinking time. So I need. To, I, I've been to ISU before. If I cut into your beer drinking time, you're less happy about my talk. Well, thank you very much, Pete. Appreciate Thanks. your time, and uh, we have small gifts from the International Space University. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you.